Thank you, Lord. All right, we just said greet one another, no family reunions. We're, th we're thrilled that you're with us this morning. And uh, I didn't catch that. Was this something I did? Where's the barbecue? Well, uh, savers right after church. Amen. Listen, uh, uh, if you're listening online, we appreciate you being with us. And uh, uh, we tell those listening, we uh, let us know that you're there. And uh, certainly uh, encourage you to communicate with one another. And, and uh, if you have a question, I try to look at those at the end. And most of the time, I always get them answered or responded to it in the minimum. And uh, so we appreciate your listening. We always ask folks to, you know, to share the message. I want to say to our church family, and even those that are listening online, especially those that are local, that, uh, uh, that you know, this week we'll be posting stuff about Easter. It's really important this week that you share that. And, uh, you know, we want to, you know, have a good turnout for Easter, not just because we want to have a good turnout, but, uh, you know, that uh, it's Christ is worthy of our time on Resurrection Sunday. He's worthy of the time, the attention, the worship. Uh, and so we do a lot of stuff to you know, help encourage people to come out and, and do it all unashamedly. And uh, glad to do it because I, I do think it needs to be a, a good time for the kids and for families. And so a lot will be going on next week. And I won't do the announcements because Miss Amanda does it better than I do. But I do want to encourage you to, if you will, to, to reshare those things. It would be good if you've got friends you want to invite, uh, tag them and uh, those things as they come up. Thank you, Lord. Always look forward to this week. we got Carry the Cross coming up. There is going to be a rally uh, Sunday morning. And uh, so it's going to be a great day. Looks like the weather's good this year, and uh, we're thankful for that. But quite a shock from yesterday, wasn't it? Oh, my. You know, I don't know. Probably another time this spring. But, uh, man, I opened my car door yesterday sitting out in the sun. I said, whoa, man, this thing is hot. And it's been quite a while since I remember feeling that. But it didn't feel like that this morning. And uh, we are putting the seat warmers on again. Thank you, Lord. All right. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to teach and to preach your gospel. I thank you, Father, that your word's good seed when it's sown on good ground in our hearts, that it'll produce good fruit. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, we've been talking about the cross coming into uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. Always like to get resurrection in there because, you know, Easter really, you know, is a, a, you know, really a pagan holiday. And, uh, but Resurrection Sunday... But we call it Easter. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm kind of like the guy about, you know, I'm, I'm the same way about Santa Claus. Listen, it, you know, that stuff that's fun for kids. I think you can, just like the enemy has taken good things that were of God and perverted them. Well, I think we can take that. We can take other things that weren't meant for God and use them for his purpose. You know, as long as there's nothing ungodly and there's nothing ungodly going on. So we've got a lot of good things happening for the families next week. We look forward to that. We've been talking about the cross. And as we look toward Easter Sunday, it's important. And uh, it plays such a pivotal role in our lives. I've said many times, you know, the cross is, uh, is probably the most well-recognized emblem in all the world. Uh, you'll find people have crosses with diamonds, gold, silver we tattoo them on our bodies we pierce our ears with them and they're always such lovely things so lovely but the truth is that the cross for christ was not lovely now i will say it was lovely for us because of what he did but it was not lovely for him you know, we've spent a lot of time, a lot of time the last three weeks talking about a full view of the cross, we said. Not just seeing in light of our needs, but let's do address that this morning. Because ultimately, this is why he came and died. Because we had a need. We had a sin problem. I like to say that man's greatest revelation is, is that he has a need. 
until you know you have a need, you're never going to do anything about it. No change will ever take place. We wouldn't come to Christ. We would never seek any kind of change in our lives unless we could understand that we have need. We needed a Savior. And therefore, God sent His Son. Whoever believes on Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I was one of those whosoevers. 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says, I know how very well the message of the cross sounds to those. This is not your bulletin. There's, you know, we've used this every week. I've got a few verses that we've used weekly. So let me pick up once again. I know how very foolish the message of the cross sounds to those who are on the road to destruction. But we who are being saved, this message, we know it is the, it's the very power of God. Peter said this, and we'll get some of his eyewitness account. With my own eyes, I saw Christ dying on the cross. With my own eyes, I saw Christ dying on the cross. Philippians 2.8, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And then it goes on to emphasize, even the death of the cross. Now, this is a verse I've given a tremendous amount of attention and reflection. I've meditated on it a lot over the years. I feel like I've gleaned a lot from it, and I've gleaned more from it this week. That closing statement where he says, even the death of the cross, I trust that you have somewhat of a better picture of that at the close of the service this morning. He what? He humbled himself. He lowered himself. One translation says he emptied himself. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Again, you understand that the cross was the most selfless act that was ever committed. We find when we turn to looking at the cross, they have had what we refer to as the Last Supper, they're, they're practicing Passover. Jesus serves them communion. He's initiating a new covenant. He washes their feet. He tells them one will betray him. He takes them to the garden and he takes Peter, James, and John a little further on to pray with him. There in the garden, he submits himself to the will of the Father. The Bible says that there in the garden, he sweat great drops of blood. The pressure was so heavy, the Bible says that God sent in angels to minister to him. Finally, the betrayal is complete. Guards from the Sanhedrin come and arrest him. He's rushed off. His long last day has become begun. Do you know that Jesus actually, on the day that he was betrayed, he was, he was arrested, charged, arraigned, tried and crucified in one day. It was a travesty against anything that you would call justice that would be illegal in any culture. He stood before Ananias. He was sent from there to Caiaphas. The Jews not wanting to have the people angry with them, they're going to use Rome and they send him to Pilate. Pilate can find no accusation. He sends him to Herod. Herod trifles with him. He wants a miracle to be done. The, the family of Herod is well acquainted with who Christ is. For it was his father who knew that the wise men had come. He wanted to see this Jesus do a miracle, something that he'd heard of. Herod releases him and sends him back to Pilate once again. You might say that he had five hearings or five trials 
in one day. We pick up in Luke, the 23rd chapter. So the priest, the Sanhedrin, now their, their charge against Christ is blasphemy. Their charge of blasphemy is certainly worthy of death. Have you ever think about why didn't they stone him? But they don't stone him. doesn't say exactly why. We might suppose that, again, he was quite popular. You know, they had just seen the triumphant entry. If they can get Rome to do their, their murdering, well, then if the people do anger, maybe it is that they would turn their anger toward Rome. But we know this, that ultimately... The reason he wasn't stoned is the scripture must be fulfilled. Cursed, it says in the law, everyone who hangeth upon a tree. For the prophecies in in Psalms to be fulfilled about the crucifixion, for Isaiah's prophetic viewing of the crucifixion, he must suffer Roman Roman justice and Roman punishment for that to be fulfilled. So they bring him before Pilate, and we pick up in Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 and 2, and it says, And the whole multitude arose and led him to Pilate. Now you must understand, at this time, he's already been before Anas and Caiaphas. He's already been beaten, punched, beat, spit upon. And he comes before Pilate. And they began to accuse him. See, there's two charges against Jesus. See, for Rome, him calling himself the Son of God, it's not punishable by death. He's done nothing to break Roman law. So they bring him before Pilate and they accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation. Forbidding, listen to this, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, that's one. And the second, and he himself is Christ the King. Now listen to this. I want you to think about the day and time that we live in. They're accusing Jesus of insurrection and treason. That should take your breath. Insurrection and treason. And some people want to say this stuff is not political. I understand the most important thing is is God. But don't think the corruption has nothing to do with any of it. Corruption has much to do with all of it. It was because of one man's corruption Christ came into this world. That we might be purchased with something that was incorruptible, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So they accused Jesus of what of insurrection and treason. Don't pay your taxes. And there is another king. Now Pilate, now Pilate's no choir boy. Pilate's not afraid of having somebody punished, put to death. He is is the law of Rome. But Pilate has a dilemma as he looks at him. Because Pilate can find no fault in him. He asks him over and over again, "Are, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, thou sayest. Don't you know I have the power to crucify you? And Jesus says, you have no power unless it's given to you from heaven. Pilate, uh, he pleads with the, with the priest and the Sanhedrin and the people. They're not wanting to be s- satisfied. This is what Pilate does. So then Pilate took Jesus 
and scourged him. I've circled the word scourged. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a purple robe on, on him. And then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with his hands, their hands. Now, I said at the very beginning, you know, that today the cross is, could be really nice finished wood like this. It could be very clean like the cross on top of the cupola here. Very clean and straight. It can be covered in gold and silver. It can be lined with diamonds. It can be tattooed, worn around the neck, through the years, on a bracelet. Again, for us the cross is something beautiful. For him the suffering is something altogether different. The word scourge is a terrible word. This is not like watching a Western and somebody is able to use a whip and they just put a few lashes on the back. When he is scourged, there are two professional torturers that beat him with a cat of nine tails. Now, it is often said, but that's not what the Scripture says. You know, understand, sometimes we say stuff that's not necessarily in the Bible. We have reasons that we say it. We often say that Jesus received 39 stripes, but the Bible doesn't say he received 39 stripes. It was Paul who received 39 stripes. Under the law, you could lash somebody as much as 40 times. For the Romans, there is no such law. For them, there is one goal. And that is opening up the flesh to the organs. He didn't have cuts on his body. He had flesh torn from his body. He was scourged. They have one goal in mind, not to kill him. Again, they thrust a crown of thorns on his head. They, they crushed them onto his head. They beat him. They returned him to Pilate after he suffered at the hands of professional torturers. Pilate, believing this will suffice the crowd, Pilate doesn't understand the crowd's turned into a mob. They're not sufficed. Even after being scourged, the cat of nine tails had steel, sharp stones tied to the ends of those leather straps. Again, they beat him nearly to death. And Pilate went out and he said to them in John 19, 4, he says, Behold, bringing him, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. He's innocent. He's guilty. He's committed no crimes. Somewhat unlike Pilate. He's a man who has authority. The only higher authority to Pilate would be Caesar. Pilate pleads Jesus' innocence seven times times. Seven times. Do you know what all these things in the end really prove? Jesus is laying down his life. They're not taking it from him. Seven times. I find no fault. I, I, he, he, he's a just man. What crime has he committed? Seven times he pleads his innocence. Again, Jesus was arrested, arraigned, tried, punished, and crucified before sundown. He was beaten after he was returned from Herod.
It says from John 19, 12, Jesus says to Pilate, he says, my kingdom's not of this world. He goes on to tell him, he said, any power you have, it, it's, it is given to you from heaven. He does affirm to him, I, I am the Son of God. And after Jesus tells him who he is, from that time on, it says, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. If you let this man go, you are not F Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. This is Pilate's dilemma. If I do not heed to the crowd, if I do not bend my knee to the mob, then word gets to Caesar. I had a treasonous man stand before me, and I did not execute Roman justice. He claimed to be king when Caesar alone is king. This is Pilate's dilemma. Pilate's wife has a dream. She says to Pilate, she says, listen, I've suffered many things because of this man this day. Do nothing to this innocent man. In John 19, 14 through 16, he said to the Jews, Behold the king. But they cry out, Away with him! And here's the word. This is what they want. Crucify him. We want him on a cross. We want him to be shamed. We are going to mar his name in history. Crucify him. We want him to have a criminal's death. Crucify him. Treat him like you would a rapist, a murderer, a thief, a traitor. Treat him like you would treat the most vilest of people. Crucify him. Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answers, said, we have no king. All of a sudden, they've become very connected politically. We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered them, him to them to be crucified. And so they took him away. Deuteronomy 21, 23 reads this way. See, his crucifixion is, is well documented. To me, the most powerful case concerning apologetics is the crucifixion of Christ. You could say his life in general because it's so well documented in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, His body shall not remain overnight on a tree, but you shall bury him that day, so that you shall not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who hangs on the tree is accursed of God. This is what's in their minds. We'll be free of him. This will be the end of him. The people will see him as cursed of God. Jesus comes to the cross. I'm going to focus on one of them, but let me share with you Jesus' seven last statements on the cross. His first one is for those who are perpetuating his cru crucifixion. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see the greatest act of mercy. He looks at the, the one thief on the cross, the, the repented one, the, the broken one. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, every one of these statements is excruciating. 
We always have to remember they beat him nearly to death. His body is open everywhere. Every nerve in his body is racked with pain. They lay him on the ground. They lay him on the cross. They have these 16-inch spikes they put through his wrists, through his feet. They throw that, they, they pull that cross up in the air and it goes into the ground. And every nerve ending in his body screams again. They hang on the cross. They say during, the, during a crucifixion, their arms would lengthen as much as nine inches on each side. The only way to breathe is to press against the nails in your feet and pull up on the nails in your wrist. Suffocation is a terrible thing. Your body will go through great pain to grasp a breath. Every one of these statements took Jesus forcing himself up in the air to gasp at air so he could make these statements. And he says to this man, you see this great mercy, today you'll be with me in paradise. He looks down and there's so few that have followed him all the way to Golgotha. You know what Golgotha means? The skull. Jewish tradition teaches this. The reason it's called Golgotha, because Adam was buried there and his skull is beneath the cross. And blood flowed down upon the ground where Adam may have been buried, covering the transgressions of this first fallen man. He then turns to his mother and he looks at his disciple. He says, woman, behold your son. Then he says to his disciple, behold your mother to be sure that she would be cared for in his absence. His fourth statement on the cross to me is one of the most heart-wrenching statements on the cross. We remember that he's, while he's altogether human, he preexisted. He was altogether God. He had never known a moment in all time, in all history, in all eternity, where God was not present in his life. And he says this. He says, my God, my God. He always referred to to God as the Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me at this moment he's bearing the sin of the world? See, Pilate has already made a great case. He's an innocent man. He's guilty of nothing. He's certainly not guilty of death. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The psalmist says this, for the righteous are never forsaken. But yet in this moment, God turns his back on the Son. He cannot look upon sin. He becomes the sin bearer. The prophet Isaiah said this, For he hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He is what? He has been forsaken. We at times in life, we, we know what it's like to fail. We know what it's like to feel guilty for failure. We know what it's like to have failed to come through. We know what it's like to live with when we say something we should not have said. But you know, few of us know what the, what the sin of a murderer feels like. Or any other horrific act of sin. And in this moment's time, Jesus bears all that sin, all that pain, and all that suffering. See, he's taking our place. This is the substitutionary work of Christ. He's bearing the penalty and the punishment of others. He's not only feeling it physically, he is deserted spiritually. 
the weight of it is on him emotionally. He finally says, he says, I thirst. And he ends closer. This is the one we'll focus on. And finally, he, he utters, it's really one word in the Greek. It's the word tetelestai. In the English, we say it is finished. And with his very last breath, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. What did Jesus do? He gave up the ghost. They did not take his life from him. He laid it down. Therefore, the Father loves him. We preached that last week. Let's pick up the term, though, that it is finished because it means so much to you and I. In Ephesians 1, 7, he that was rich in kindness, that purchased our freedom through the blood of his Son, and our sins are forgiven. We turn to John 19, 30, the, 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 one of the particular texts where he says this, and when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, after having said he was thirsty, he said, it is finished to tell us die. He bowed his head. He gave up the ghost. To tell us die. It's finished. It's a Greek word. The Greek language was very colorful. It so often takes us more than one English word to explain what that expression meant. To tell us die means this. We all know that it means paid in full, but listen to what it means fully. To bring to an end. Completion or conclusion. To fulfill or to finish. To tell us die means this. It's a turning point when one ends and another begins. Finally, it does mean full and final payment. Now, just what is finished at this critical moment at the end of Jesus' life. All history has built to this very moment. In the midst of his pain, his suffering, his anguish, listen to this. To tell us die is a cry of victory. He did not fail at sin. He did not fail at selfishness. He did not fail in obedience. He had fully followed the Father. There are four significant things in that definition that you can see that is accomplished at the end of this wonderful life. This unique life. When you talk about the exclusivity of Christ, this is exclusive. Nobody else could have accomplished it. Here's the first thing that is accomplished when you keep that definition in mind. Jesus came to do this, to do the will of the Father. And that has been what? Accomplished. There's nothing left. There's no reason to live one more day. You know, we say, and, 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 and I, I don't think that we're ungenuine when we say it, but we say, well, I will be here as long as the Lord wants me. And, and that's good. Believing we're going to have a lot more days. But for him, it's finished. It's finished. Mission accomplished. In the area of doing the will of the Father, victory. Adam failed, but the second Adam, oh, he fully succeeded. The second thing, that well, John 6, 38, For I have not come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do what the will of him who has sent me. He's been what? He's been victorious. 
You'll remember that we said when we talked about there, there was that eternal principle that God wanted to rule in our hearts. The, if you will, the principle of the cross has always been and always will be. God wants to rule in our lives. He wants to be enthroned in our hearts. Therefore, we had to have the historic cross, the place of Christ's example, while his example is screaming at us. It's finished. I had fulfilled his will. I didn't do mine. I fully accomplished his. The second thing that is accomplished is that when the high priest would go in, after having made atonement for the sins of the nation, he would use a term that was equivalent to telestai, and it was this. It is done. It's completed. Meaning this. Atonement for sin was made for one more year. But here's the uniqueness once again. When we talk about, all right, what does tetelestai mean? It means to come to an end, to be completed. Now, Jesus, unlike the high priest, the high priest has got to return every year to that holy place. Every year to that holy place. He entered in, had to enter into that place called the Holy of Holies. When Jesus does give up the ghost, when he commends his spirit into the, into, into the care of the Father, is fully surrendered. The Bible says that in the temple, the veil was rent from top to bottom as if somebody had torn it. But listen, to had torn it, it is not like a scarf. It's inches thick. It would have took teams of horses to tear it in two, going different directions. But what the veil's rent, it's open. The blood's been applied. He's entered in. Now, the high priest every year, he has to go back in and make atonement again. Look at Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he offered what? Everybody say one. One. Just one. Once again, we're talking about unique. We're talking about the only one. It's just one. He offers what? One sacrifice for sin. How long? Forever. Forever. He enters that sacrifice. You... And you know what he does? He sits down. Tetelestai, we've won. I've triumphed over sin. There is no more sacrifice. The high priest, he can't sit down. Why? He's got to come back again next year. He must make another sacrifice for sin. But Jesus, he sits down. The sacrifice has been completed. It's been fulfilled. There'll never be another sacrifice for sin. Tetelestai. It's accomplished. It's accomplished. The third reason that it's significant, when he says this word, to tell us die, the high priest, again, he could not sit down, but Christ sits down forever because there'll be no more sacrifice. The third one is this. There is a settling of our debt. It's paid in full. This is the one we're most most comfortable with, we're most familiar with. Listen, we're like in the parable of the, the servant who owed the master much. And the Bible says, as much as he had not to pay, he begged him. He begged him to forgive him. He's never going to pay this debt. There's not enough time in a lifetime to pay this debt. He begs him to pay the debt. Jesus shows up. This is, it's, it's much larger than this, but just think about this. They're going to they're gonna repossess your car. They'll call your mortgage due on your house. They've turned off your lights. 
They've garnished your wages, and you have nothing to pay with. Oh, so many fold more. This is our sin. There's no payment to be made. I could never be good enough. You could never be good enough. We could not earn it. We did not deserve it. Do you know that there was a place in, in their day and time, and, and it was called the slave market. And people would go down to the slave market, and, and they would examine the slaves. Here's what's crazy. Is Jesus is a substitute. He's both the buyer and the servant at the same time. The buyer would go to the slave market. He would begin to examine the slaves. And you'll remember Pilate examined him. He said, I find no fault in him. The buyer would look at the slaves. Horrific. Inhumane. And he might beat the slave a little bit to see if he was sturdy. And Jesus takes the beating. He examines him. It's, it's in him name. He, he'll strip him down, him examine him. Jesus hung on the cross, naked before humanity. We're very polite. We paint pictures of him with a loincloth on. He was without clothing. Crucifixion was to dehumanize people. There was nothing humane. There's no reason to think that he had on a loincloth. You could understand why, why an artist, especially when you're talking about in ages gone by, some of the masters who have painted some of the greatest portraits concerning Christ, they just not would, could not permit themselves to, to do such a thing. And, and we all appreciate that. But there on the cross... Our debt for as much as we have not to pay. He takes the beating and he makes the payment both. He does the suffering and he, and he also does the ransoming. This is why he is what? He is the God-man. He is altogether God. He's altogether man. Oh, yes, he didn't suffer as God. He suffered as man. He set aside the privileges of being God. Why? So debt could be paid. Justice had to be satisfied. Somebody has to pay the bill. Somebody has to pay the bill. One of these days in this nation, somebody will pay the bill. The debt's been settled to Telestai. It's a moment of triumph. It's a moment of accomplishment. But then listen to this. Again, the Bible tells us that you're not what? You're not your own. Why? You've been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price. And God's not only your boss, he's everything else in between and above. You know, so oftentimes we say such foolish things as kids. You're not in charge. You're not my boss. Well, there is somebody who is. You're not your own. You were what? Bought with a price. Finally, there's this to tell us die. The old covenant is fulfilled and ended, and the new covenant is begun. In his life, he has fulfilled every prophecy. Every prophecy. In his obedience, He has satisfied every act of disobedience that Adam and man ever committed. He was all in all points tempted as we are, but yet the Bible says he was without sin. He's the only man to have kept the law. The law was for all men, but the fallen man could not satisfy the law with their best efforts, with their best intentions. Good people could not fulfill all the demands of the law. The new covenant's begun. 
Jesus has fulfilled all its demands and all its requirements. You and I could not be saved under the old covenant. And this is why there needed to be a new, a better covenant. The Bible says established us upon better promises. It was the end of one period and it was the beginning of another period. The old has what? Passed away. And the new has begun. You and I now have a high priest. He's made that one sacrifice for sin. Never entering in again. It's sufficient. It's enough. For time and for eternity. To tell us die. What is finish? Listen, it says in Hebrews 10, 9. And he said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God, and take away the first, that he may establish a second. To take away, oh, it doesn't cease to be there. It's still there. But we're not under it. We're under what? A new covenant. A high priest that will not fail. Oh, you look today, we put such hopes in people in public office. And one way, one, fa way, one way, one fashion, somehow, they fail. They fall short. But not our high priest. He does not fail. He is what? He is set down. It's, it's done. It's finished. It's completed. If you fail seven times, seven times, times seven, be seven, he will forgive you. You will never have to do anything for healing, for healing he paid for. You'll never have to do anything for favor, for favor is granted. It's what? It's paid for. I don't ever get silly. You understand? That is not to say that we can be self selfish and reckless and foolish. No. I'm saying it's paid for. It's paid for. It's what? It's complete. It's accomplished. You may abandon him for a season, but in that season he will not abandon you. It's what? It's finished. He takes away the first, and he established what? A second. We have a better high priest. We have a better covenant. Established, as the Bible says, upon better promises. See, understanding the word to telestai, it is finished tells you everything you need to know when Jesus says in Philippians says he emptied himself he humbled himself and he became obedient and it says and obedient to the death of the cross he was obedient to the point what he 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 was he willingly suffered separation from the father pain that's unimaginable Humiliation that is dehumanizing. Accusations that are unjust. He what? He emptied himself. See, this is the reason that there's a resurrection. Why? He conquered. He conquered what it meant to be a man. He fully followed God. He what? He became obedient. But again, see, this means so much more to me this week than when I said it last week. Obedient to the death of the cross. Nothing else was ever like it. He, he suffered again emotionally, physically, spiritually. I'll close with this. It's finished. He was submitted and committed 
as he came to the cross, abused and abruised, beaten and bludgeoned. Man's sin required sacrifice, and his life was given. Forsaken by God, betrayed by men. Obeyed till obedience fulfilled God's call. He bled and he breathed till he could no more. To tell us die, Jesus triumphed over Adam's fall. Every head bowed, no one looking around. You might be here this morning, you may have never made a decision concerning Christ. We'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. He made the greatest sacrifice by not just emptying himself of privilege, but suffering every indignity known to mankind, suffered every pain, Every sense of abandonment that any person ever felt, he experienced it, and yet without sin. He is worthy of our commitment. If you're here this morning, you've never accepted Christ, we'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm not just asking you, would you like to be saved? Who in the world wouldn't want to miss hell and go to heaven? Everybody would. I'm not just asking if you want to be saved. See, the Bible teaches us that we must confess Him as Lord. Will you ask Him to be the Lord of your life? Too many times we've left that out. People have given invitations. Would you like to get saved? No, would you like to accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Salvation comes with it. Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess, if you say with your mouth, Lord Jesus, if you surrender everything, if you follow that example, you surrender everything. I, I, I'm not only giving you my sin. See, who doesn't want to give Jesus their sin? Everybody would like to get unload their sin. He doesn't just want your sin. He wants your heart. He wants your love. He wants your affection. He wants your time. He wants your treasure. You say, Bill, it's too much. No, the cross was too much. He paid more than enough. He's El Shaddai. He's a God of more than enough. He paid more than enough. He's the only one that can ask for all those things. But listen, He is worthy of all that, and He need not promise you and I anything else. But he says this, but he that believeth on me will not perish, but have everlasting life. He says, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. You never lived until you've lived with him and for him. I'll give you abundant life. Your purpose is real. The affection is deep. The peace is strong. The heaviness of sin is free. He need give us nothing, but He does. But you must make Him the Lord of your life. Have you ever asked Jesus to be Lord of your life? I'm not asking you if you've ever joined a church, if, you, if you've got membership, if you've got a Sunday school pin. I'm not asking you if you've ever been baptized. I think all those things are good. But if we can trust in those things and not fully trusting in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, our trust is misplaced. I will not get into the kingdom of God because I'm a Presbyterian. I will not get into the kingdom of God because I'm a Roman Catholic. I will not get into the kingdom of God because I'm a Baptist. You take your papers with you, they'll burn with everything else. Because everything we have, it's only that which we've done for God that will stand the test. Have you ever accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you ever said, Lord Jesus, I believe you're God's own Son? Can you believe that? Can you believe that He lived a sinless life? Many people would say yes, and I'd say that's good. But you could be like King Agrippa. Thou almost persuadest me. Don't be Agrippa. Be persuaded. Paul said, I am persuaded. 
Can you believe that he was judged for you? Can you believe he was tried for you? Can you believe that he died for you? If you say yes to all that, you're a great candidate to be saved. Most importantly, do you believe in the resurrection? For if he lives, you can live also. If you believe those things, then you are in a position to ask Jesus to become the Lord of your life. For he has conquered everything. And he wants to sit on a throne in your heart. Have you accepted him as Lord? We're going to pray, inviting everyone in the room to pray with us. Say this with me. If you don't know the Lord, say this with me. Say, Bill, I've known the Lord, but I've wandered in my faith. Pray this with us. Now, let me tell you, praying a prayer won't save you, won't make you right with God. But if you mean it in your heart, you say it with your mouth. The Bible says, confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved. We're going to invite everyone in the room to pray with us. Say this with me. If you're listening online, say it with us. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe He lived. I believe He died. I believe He died for me. Lord Jesus, come in my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and as my Savior. I give you my everything. I give you my sin, my hurt, my heart, my talents. I give you my time. You're my Lord. I give you everything. God, I thank you. Your Son, Jesus, is my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that with your mouth, if you believed it in your heart, if you wandered from him, you've made it straight. If you said it with your mouth and believed it in your heart, if it wasn't just rote repetition, if you didn't know God, if you said it with your mouth and you believed it in your heart, you've been saved. You've been saved. You've received the gift of eternal life. I'm going to close. In a few moments, there'll be prayer partners. If you prayed that prayer this morning, will you meet with one of these prayer partners? Tell them when when Pastor Bill prayed, I prayed also. Would you tell somebody in your life that you asked Jesus to be Lord of your life? Thank you, Lord. If you're listening online, would you tell somebody that you made a decision? Would you message us? I'm going to turn the service to Leon. God bless.